yeah, you know baby. how it goes. Yeah, baby. Step two. Step two. Stamina for so. Anthony Yard. It's a movie. You know the set. <laughs> Let's go, bro. You know how it goes. <laughs> Oi, oi, welcome to the Pep Talk UK Sports Podcast, the podcast that talks the major boxing and football news from around the globe, real points of view from a real panel, hashtag real talk on Pep Talk, please subscribe to Pep Talk UK on iTunes and YouTube, don't forget to like, share and comment. Now I'm your host Frankie B and I'm joined by a sick panel. Now joining us once again is one of the original Pep Talk boys from Paris. It's Pascal. How you doing, bro? Oui, oui, Pascal. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Frankie B, I am very well indeed. And uh, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, mate. And I'm feeling great. A bit like Tyson Fury, mate, who's uh, who's back, mate. We're telling the mic. <laughs> Tyson, there's only one Tyson Fury. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is. You got to give it to him. You know, he's uh, not only is he Batman, but he's uh, David Copperfield. You know, he's um, he's been able to um, you know to to fight the band, and uh, I, I believe it's it's a retrospective band. So, you know, he should be back in the ring before we know it. Yeah, and he's you know he's in the gym already, singing a bit of Mark Morrison. Return at the Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, cer- he certainly was. He, he's, a, he's a character, and I think yeah. boxing, heavyweight boxing, you know, they certainly miss a character like Tyson Fury. It's, you know, yeah. everybody seems to be so serious, and he's um, he's certainly the, the joker of the lot. Yeah, and you know, to be fair, we've got to kind of, you know, recognize that he was the man that put the, the excitement back in heavyweight boxing, because when the Klitschko's were ruling, it was pretty, da- it was pretty dour, man, to be fair. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I agree. They were, they, you know, the Klitschko's are, you know, uh, they're just gentlemen, you know, and they, they respect the sport and that uh, they didn't inject much, uh, you know, uh, personality. You know, they were very much about the, the, you know, the fight and there was no outside ring antics, you know, whereas Tyson Fury has got the skill, you know, he's got the personality and they certainly has the creativity, you know, to, to make us all want to tune in to see what else he's going to say. So, you know, I do like him and I'm very glad that he's back. And uh, you will be back uh, in our TVs very, very quickly. Yes, welcome back to Gypsy King. I'll be going on IG tomorrow to see another training video from Tyson Fury. <laughs> <laughs> right now, Pascal, you want to shout your social media? Yes, uh, Toddy, uh, I, am, I am available on Twitter and Instagram. It's very simple, Pascal underscore the underscore sad at, uh, yeah, at uh, Instagram and Twitter. My guy! Right, now I'd like to welcome back and return for ex-writer for the Ring magazine Ukraine, it's Petar Sugarov. How you doing, Geese? I'm doing great, man. Gay Crasher is here. He's ready to talk some boxing again. Yes, indeedy. We've had a lot of snow over here. How's it been over there? Has it been pretty cold? No. No, not, 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 not particularly cold. It's, uh, it's good in South Ukraine. No snow. Just training, man. Just training, oh, excellent. Excellent, excellent. We're, we're going to get into your man, Lomachenko, in a little bit. Um, but otherwise, um, what are you looking forward to in terms of boxing next year? Any particular potential matchups that you might, you might be excited by? I got asked that question a lot. My fight of the year, most uh, fight I, I've been looking for is Lomachenko Garcia. Yes, my, yes, Mikey. one three five. Yep. Want to see that fight badly? Yes. Yeah. And that is a really close one. I think with um, Lomachenko yeah, yeah, with yeah. you know, he was the overwhelming favorite. But this fight against Mikey Garcia, well, that is very very tight to yeah. call. Cool. Fascinating fight. At least he should, he should fight Linares. Cool. At the very least. Mate, that, yeah. is, that is more mouth than a, 
Uh, and Nando's, yeah. mate, with the halloumi cheese, mate. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you want to shout out your social media? Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, as always, follow me on Twitter, on Gatecrasher UA, and Facebook at Peter Gatecrasher Sugar Off. My and, uh, God. We, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, no worries. What you going to say? No, visit, uh, if you speak Russian, visit my site, Boxing.ru. You can always find some good news out there, yeah. Cracking stuff. My guy, Pet Sugar Off. Right, finally, I'd like to introduce Britain's shortest boxer, but he certainly packs a punch. <laughs> Reese Taylor, a.k.a. Show me the show me. How you doing, my brother? What's happening, brother? What's happening? What's I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm all good. What's good? <laughs> Perry Bar crew, Lazelle's crew. What up? And Hansworth. Hansworth. <laughs> Bearwood. It's, okay, it's crazy okay. right now. It's crazy right I now. I know. I know. We're linking up. <laughs> <laughs> Link up TV. Big up. And it. And it. <laughs> right, Reese. So, yes. show you. I'll call you show So Okay. Obviously, just got the W in spectacular yeah. fashion last time out of York Hall. Yes. You, you must be buzzing off of that. That was pretty. That that went viral. That knockout. Serious, bro. Serious. I feel like it, it did get quite big, didn't it? Mm. I just want to keep the momentum building now, and then the start of next year, just get ready to put it all in again, and just keep trying to win in spectacular fashion. Yeah, because it's been pretty early in your career. You know, you've only had yeah. three fights, and yeah. you know, you've got a long career ahead of yourself, haven't you? This is it, and because I um, I started boxing quite late, I feel like there's less mileage mm. and damage on me, so I feel like I'll be able to go for go for longer. Indeed, indeed, indeed. You know, yeah. but don't say it in that way. That's a different podcast, mate. You know. That's a different one. That's not pep talk, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you know, against most fighters that you're fighting, you've got to overcome yeah. reach and you've got to overcome height. How do you yeah. manage to to get inside and overcome your taller opponents most of the time? Mike Tyson, baby. Just, <laughs> yeah. just you know, just work on the inside and body, head, head, body, head, and just. You know, work on inside, but while I'm coming on the inside as well, make sure my defense is still tidy, so I'm not neglecting my defense at the same time as coming forward. Well, that's pretty uh, useful tips. And what would you say in terms of uh, next year? What would you say would be your ultimate goal? Um, my ultimate goal. Um, my ultimate goal for next year is to have either about three or four fights. And then afterwards, once I've got to about, let's say, six bouts, then I'm looking at Midlands title because I can see there's not many mm -hmm. people in my way in the Midlands. So I feel like I could fight for a Midlands within another three to four fights. Mm -hmm. Super flyweight. Yes, super fly. Yeah. Okay. Anybody you want to call out? <laughs> uh, nah, early days, yeah, early days. Soon, you know, when the time's right, but put everybody on notice to be honest that I'm not playing you know what I mean all them flyweights but you know what I mean all on notice but yeah we'll soon you know we'll soon be ready for that but for now just anybody in my way I'm just looking to get rid of because you know what they say Frankie you don't get paid for overtime <laughs> indeedy and take heed you know show you might have to go on Aggie this is it because yes. right you know after after hit you know the Tevin Farmer result the other oh, day I heard he Robert. I heard he boxed his head off. Um, his opponent barely laid a glove on him. You know, the... boxed his head off, and you know somebody works that hard all their life and career to and then gets to the point of a world title and then just gets it stole from them. Yeah, it's and I, it's you know crazy. what I mean. It's crazy. So... That's crazy. Right. <sighs> Now, show you want to shout out your social media as you get moving. Yeah, um, yeah. My Twitter is um, at Showy the Showman. Instagram at Showy the Showman as well, but the show is S H O W Y, not S H O W I E. So at Showy S H O W Y, and my Facebook is um, Showy Alkaline because for some reason it won't let me um, have that Showy the Showman. So yeah. 
Yeah, show the showman. <laughs> Permanent <Yeah>. massive. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gents, for the fight fans locked in, for the football fans locked in, now it's time for some real talk on Pep Talk. Let's go. Yes, we ready. Let's get into it. It's real talk. It's pep talk. So we're going to start with the boxing. And there was no bigger shock last weekend than James DeGale losing his IBF super middleweight title to Caleb Truax. Why? Now, Pascal, Miguel was 101 on to win the fight. We all backed him in last week's podcast. I guess we were all guilty of looking ahead to bigger fights, and we underestimated Truax, didn't we? Uh, we certainly did. I mean, you know, prior to the fight, we we you know we were aware that Truax was a very durable fighter, you know, tenacious individual, and uh, we expected James again to win in a in emphatic fashion. You know, it was his uh, first fight in the UK for quite some time. You know, since Three the years. draw against yeah. Badu Jack. Yes, of course. You know, and uh, you know we respect James again because he's one of those uh, you know road road rangers who's taken the. The route to world championship the hard way. Away from home, you know, yeah. I remember where where um, you know Hennessy where, where um were showcasing his talent, you know, and he wasn't making it on on uh, some of the big TV networks, particularly after his defeat to George Groves. It's as if you know the boxing promoters didn't want to promote mm-hmm. him anymore, so yeah, yeah. he he had to work very hard to get to where he got to. So actually I'll, start I'll, from the bottom, yeah, started from the bottom, and now he was here, and, and the concern <laughs> me. The big concern for me is, uh, you know, an old disrespect to Truax, mm. but, you know, James again should be beating, you know, fighters like Truax, Truax. quite convincingly. Yeah. I was I was expecting a stoppage, you know, um, certainly on the basis that his, his shoulder that he complained a lot about, you know, was being repaired. He, he claimed during training mm-hmm. and during his press conferences yeah, that he's, brand new. He's, yeah. he's never felt better, you know, than ever. But I was also concerned as the, you know, the, the, the dry snitching of Carl Froch, shout out to Carl Froch, that, uh, you've got, if you don't live the life of a boxer, you will get found out. So, I'm not sure whether Carl is uh, alluding that James again spent mm-hmm. too much time on, you know, uh, hitting the, the, the clubs and popping bottles, or whether he's not applying himself as a, you know, during his training. The thing is, we know that boxing, you cannot play boxing, and if you cut corners, he will show you in the ring. It's the most honest sport in the world, in, to some extent, because if you do not train for it, you will show up on the, on the night, you will show that the preparation wasn't, wasn't done. So, I'm just concerned that, uh, perhaps, you know, James, James again may well just have to consider, you know, uh, um, you know, having to go back on the road again and having to regain the respect of the British public because, you know, d- during the fight, Truax, certainly the, the cheering for Truax was quite um, concerning for for the foreign champion, for yeah, the foreign yeah, fighter. Yeah. For the home fighter. You oh, know, the, the foreign for fighter on the home soil. Well, yeah, on, soil. On, on, on home soil, to me, suggests that James again is having a difficult time in getting the support of the local people. You know, and um, Truax, you know, will go on to benefit from this because now the sky is the limit for him. You know, mm-hmm. for a guy that's not even in the top ten to, start, to to acquire a world title, I mean, that's for him. It's Christmas coming early. Oh yeah, and there's talk of uh, Matchroom, him going to Matchroom USA, which obviously for him is going to be a massive platform. You know? Of course, he holds the IBF title now, so the big fights are really ahead of him. Of course, you know, and this is a guy that was expected to lose, you know, and he, and he just goes to show that anything can happen. But for me, is the lack of preparation. I think that James again, you know, to some extent should have taken an easier fight, you mm. know. And also, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, the preparation that he thought he had wasn't quite, uh, you know, up, up to par because, you know, Truax bullied him. You know, um, James again showed some vulnerabilities in the, mm-hmm. in the back foot, you know. He's not the best boxing on the back foot. He's better going, you know, forward offensively. And we saw that he struggled against, you know, a, a true act that was tenacious and, and coming forward. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, of, of things you need to work in the gym. 
I have no doubt that James has a talent, but my concern is that this defeat has derailed some very important fights for James again. You know, on the horizon, there were fights with, uh, you know, uh, Eubank Jr., yeah, George Rose, yep. Benavidez, you know, a lot of money on the table, you know, and uh, it was an opportunity for him to prove Eddie Earn wrong, and he looks like Eddie Earn has won that particular, um, you know, that, that particular battle in, in releasing him and allowing him to join Frank Warren. Yeah. To, to be fair, we all made the mistake. You know, we were all talking about Eubank Jr., all talking about Jules Groves, Benavidez, and literally, we didn't forget that Truex would be coming to to fight for a world title. You know, that's that's his boyhood dream as well to be a champion. Of course, and we overlooked that. Yeah, we certainly did. You know, and I believe that James again himself overlooked Truex because if you train. You know, they always say in boxing to always concentrate on your opponent in front of you. But during the press conference and the build up, you know, James was openly talking about future opponents as if the, the, Benavides, the fight, was, Benavides you know, was meant to be next and then George Groves. Or, of course, yeah. Uh, you know, so, so he was looking at unifying the, the division and he was talking in the future as if he had already, you know, handled through acts. <laughs> and this is a lesson for every fighter that, you know, concentrate on the job in front of you because, you know, there's always an obstacle before we can go on to the next fight, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's a lesson that um, James again will have learned, I'm sure. And, you know, uh, I suppose it's all in the name, isn't it? True acts. You know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but listen, true life, out, baby. Yeah. Big shout out to True X and the Polyquas, you know, in the Puerto Ricans <laughs> around the world. But he's made himself very proud, and uh, I understand he's got a new newborn baby also. And uh, what a what, what a way to welcome his newborn baby and to support them by by winning a, a world championship. So. Congratulations to, to Truax, you know, we try to op- offer an objective platform where we talk about boxing without showing too much favoritism. But I also believe that James Gale can come back from this, you know, he will just have to work a bit harder than every- everyone else to prove that he's still world championship level. But Frankie B, what is the, uh, the deal with the uh, rematch clause? Because there's some ambiguity about that. Well, there was no rematch clause. It makes you wonder whether he should have entered the Super 6 tournament, maybe, you know? Mm. Or perhaps he may, he may well enter it at some point, you know, uh, next year. To be fair to the man, he had shoulder s- surgery, right? Been out of the ring for 11 months. Uh, he was in with a really tough opponent that absolutely gave everything and didn't let up for the whole 12 rounds. Literally, he was come forward, come forward, come forward. You know, when you're just getting back into the ring after like almost a year, that's, that's really tough work, mate. So do you believe it was a bad night at the office or bad day at the office? Uh, I think the fight was too soon. I think it was too soon. I think you should have had an easy opponent and then eased his way in. But like I said, Truex, I think everybody, including James DeGale, uh, we overlooked him. Now I'll remember the name, True Life. I'll call it True Life. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter, um, in terms of James DeGale, what went wrong for him? Do you think it was a case of overconfidence or did he forget how hungry Truex would be to win a world title? I don't think De Gea was overconfident. I think you're right, Frankie. I think it was too early for him to come back after such a bad injury. Those uh, shoulder injuries are nasty. Uh, I know the Vitaly Klitschko, after that bird fight, after when he quit in his corner, that uh, shoulder injury changed his career around. He never was able to properly hit with that hand anymore mm-hmm. and that's his jab and, hand uh, that's what you build from your jab yeah 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 yeah. and uh, with Miguel he was out uh, for 11 months I think 10 months I think he should take an, a, a little bit more time to rest to properly heal and then uh, I think I'm not sure uh, he, sh- he should have taken a weaker opponent I think Truex uh, was just about right for him to come back but at this point, uh, I think he was just not ready for this. Nobody expected Truex to fight like that. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, to be fair, to be fair, we did overlook him. Yeah, n- nobody expected that. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, like I said, maybe you know, he was guilty of talking about other opponents. Yeah, if- I've heard. I've heard he didn't have much time. Spend much time in gym. He was doing yeah. something else. Yeah, he had operation in June. Things, yeah. If yeah, he had yeah, an operation yeah. in June, 
yeah, in December. That's not really a long time, to be fair, to heal up, get your get your body in perfectly working order. Yeah, rehabilitation should take some more time than that. Yeah, about that rematch clause. Uh, rematch clause. Uh, I think uh, Heyman Boxing came out and said there is, there actually is a oh, rematch is, clause. There? Yeah, yeah, wow. I think it, I think it is. Yeah, they manage both. They manage both Truex and. Uh, and the game, I think we should we should see a rematch. Well, Showy, um, in terms yes, of bro. In terms of true acts, uh, he said he watched a lot of um, James the Girl versus Badu Jack, and yeah. he said he liked what Badu Jack done. So he just yeah. literally replicated what he done and yes. put the pressure on from yes. round one to twelve. Yes. Was that what, was that what won him the fight? Pressure. I well, hundred percent. And I just think tracks for you know what. I'm just gonna keep dug in and keep coming forward and he probably thought James the Girl hasn't got the power to keep me off so here what I'm just gonna I'm just gonna eat your punches to give take some to give some mm. and you know the game plan um the game plan worked for him and maybe it was to do with chunky underestimating but I feel like maybe he recovered to get back um from his injury but maybe Maybe he was he wasn't as sharp as he should have been, and maybe he took um, Truax a little bit lightly. Yeah, I think I Truax why. patterned him. Truax patterned him, looked at his pattern, and just thought, you know what? I'm just gonna come give a hundred percent every round, and I think that threw Chunky off. Indeed, but you know, in fairness, some people are a little bit harsh as well. Okay. The first fight the girl lost was against uh, George Groves in a very tight fight. Yeah, yeah that could, could have gone either way. Yeah. Yes. Either way. And the second fight, losing to Truax, literally was a surprise. It was a bad night at the office. Yeah. He just came back from injury. So I think people don't need to go overboard. They just need to recognise that, you know what, it was a bad night and he'll learn from this. Next time I think he'll be a lot more focused. And sometimes, you know what, you learn a lot more through defeat. You know, than victory. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's not like James the girl can't get back. He can definitely recover from this. I just, I think we're stuck in an error as well. With with Mayweather being undefeated, there's so much emphasis. Oh yeah. There's so much emphasis on that. Oh, and it's like if you have one loss, it's like oh my god, your career's done. But then if you look at all the greats, they all suffered a loss. Yeah, because they fought the best. Yeah, look at Sugar Ray, um, Sugar Ray Robinson. He had like 200 odd fights. He lost about 19 fights. We can keep going. Henry Armstrong, Jack Johnson. If we want to go deep, you know what I mean? But I, f- I do feel like this era, it, um, Mayweather has put so much emphasis where if you have one loss, it's the end of the world. And I don't think it is. <laughs> it's about learning from it. Indeed. Well, you know, hopefully... James the girl can come back. You know, he's still oh, a t- 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 fighter. I, I, I think he will. I think he. I think he will. I think maybe this will give him the kick to say, you know what, I'm. I, I've done all right in my career, but I need to get better. That's all you can do. You can either sink or swim once you've once you've had a lesson, isn't it? So. Yeah. And he came back from adversity the first time. There you go. He lost the growth. There you go. And he can do it yeah. again. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's all you, you have to do, mate. You have to just pick yourself back up and dust yourself off and go again. Or you can feel, or you can be a baby and feel sorry for yourself. You've got two okay. options in life, in general, isn't it? So, mm. <laughs> okay. Well, well, let's move on. Um, on the same weekend, uh, we had the Titanic fight between Vasil Lomachenko versus Guillermo Rigondeaux which ended with Lomachenko coming out on top after Rigondeaux pulled out the fight with a, with a hand injury. Now, Pascal, uh, I was thoroughly Boy. disappointed in your boy Rigondeaux, who failed to live up to his pre-fight comments, and uh, it was clearly a case of, of, of no mass. It, it was a case of, you know, I mean, I've, I've been hearing that uh, Lomachenko has been renamed No Mass Chenko. Uh, <laughs> Because no more, he, no he, mass. He, he just he has that ability of making, you know, fighters quit. And you know, in my, he, he, I've been watching boxing for quite some time, and I've never seen an opponent do what 
I, I, I never seen sorry a fighter due to opponents what Lomachenko he's been doing and he's truly a remarkable fighting machine you know and, uh, and uh, I, I must say that I've grown a lot more fonder of Lomachenko as a result of the consistent uh, you know the performances that he's been putting on and you know and he's a three fighter and uh, in terms of the, the, the style that uh, his father has created is completely unique and he will take an exceptional fighter to defeat Lomachenko you know um, and it's a shame that he has a blemish on his record but you know as Shoei said that doesn't take anything away from the fact that he's a he's an exceptional fighter and as for Guillermo I'm not sure, you know, the problem I have with Guillermo is that Guillermo had always complained about the lack of opportunities, you know, the fact that the TV networks do not like him because they find him boring, they find his demeanor very alienating, and unfortunately for him, that performance has not, you know, has not given any confidence to anybody wanting to see him fight again, you know, <laughs> he, he, he talked a lot of talking, you know, and a lot of trash him, talk, a lot. He's still a, a, a remarkable fighter he, in my eyes. He's still very much one of the top five boxers at the moment. But the mere fact that he wasn't able to finish the 12 round, even if he had lost a unanimous decision, he would have got a lot more, re, re, a lot more respect from the fans and also a lot more respect from the critics of Rigonda. But the fact that he, he quit on his stool, you know, and blaming his, his, his wrist, you know what? What has he been doing with his wrist? Is it too much? Of, uh, you know, uh, uh, late night action. I mean, I, I did not. <laughs> I did not see anything. You know, that caused him to cause to have a problem w- with his wrist. To but even so, you got people like Isaac Chamberlain who fought. You know, for a fight with a dislocated shoulder. Of course, and, you, you know, know he, he could have fought. On. This is a man that that's walked, you know, from Mexico to the USA, you know, uh, defecting from Cuba. You know, there's 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 rumors about how tenacious he is as an individual. You know, the not afraid campaign that he was, you know, that he was uh, circulating in social media, and for him to crumble like that and to not give a complete, you know, a 12 round fight when he was clearly. In my, in my eyes, he wasn't particularly hurt. He didn't look particularly, you know, in, in a way, you know, suffering from any eye socket damage or anything like that. It's just very bad. It's a very, it's very bad because the fight was building up in momentum. People began to pay attention to it. And the mere fact that he didn't even try to complete the fight and the fact that, you know, he, he, he just literally, you know, during the fight also, the, the fight itself was, was a terrible shambles. It was a terrible fight. You know, I- he, he, he almost I felt like he wanted to make love to Novakchenko by holding him so much. <laughs> you know, what's, what is going on with you? You know, Guillermo, you're supposed to be the jackal. You're supposed to be this aggressive, you know, um, you know, right hand power punching, you know, counter puncher. And Lomachenko literally bamboozled him into submission. And there was one point. You see that point in the fight when he like Lomachenko gave him like four uppercuts in a row. That was. Uh, <laughs> that was something it, else. It, it was, I mean, Lomachenko, you know, to concentrate on him, his footwork already, had, I felt that, you know, caused some problems. His, his angles, the way that he's able yeah. to shift, you know, and also the way that he's able to pick up the speed. The boy, the boy is like a 911 turbo, you know, he can go from 0 to, to, you know, to 60 in, in literally two seconds, you know, and, he's, and he has no, this, his patterns are very difficult to read. And no, no boxer has ever faced anybody like Lomachenko. So therefore, there, there is no way to prepare for him. There is no, there is no blueprint, as Mayweather would say. And it's very difficult to prepare and to fight a, a fighter like Lomachenko because he is so creative, you know. And uh, he certainly brings in a new element of boxing where I believe that if Lomachenko becomes and dominates the, you know, his division for for the foreseeable future, mm, super the, clever. Yep. The style of boxing that you will see from Kibé from from amateurs going to professionals will be mimicking the the, Loma, the the Lomachenko style. We've seen fighters try to do the shoulder hold that Mayweather has used so mm-hmm. successfully, and we'll be seen, he's very good at that. He is very good at that, but I believe believe you me, the next generation of boxers will be looking at Lomachenko and looking at his footwork and and basically concentrating more on the on the on the, some of the most important foundation of boxing, which is how to move your feet and how to get yourself out of the way and also place angles that you never see 
before. So I've got to take my hat off to Lomachenko. He's the Mozart of boxing at the moment, you know. <laughs> Petter, uh, for you, it was a big disappointment, I thought this fight was, but was it a case of no mass for you also, Rigandau? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think he hurt uh, his hand at all. I think it was just an excuse. I think Rigo was embarrassed by, repeatedly embarrassed by Lomachenko. Loma clearly hurt his pride. That old campaign on social media, no, not afraid, last opportunity, whatever. And he was watching Rigo just, just like that. And he barely won a minute of that fight. I, yeah. I don't know if he, he, he won one minute of that fight. I think some people yeah. were saying that the first round, they might, he might have edged the first round. But after that, obviously, yeah, it was fairly, just, fairly comprehensive from Lomachenko. From Lomachenko, yeah. Shoei, um, do you yeah. think, in the end, uh, just coming up two weight classes was, a, was just a bit too much for, for Rigondeaux? You know what? I think it was more of a fact that he struggled with the skill set. The I, levels, I'm not even yeah. Gonna, yeah, I'm not even going to base it on weight. I'm basing it on skill set mm -hmm. and I just think Lomachenko's skill set was just too much for him and he was very frustrated and confused as to what he didn't have a plan B mm. Rigondeaux's yeah. plan was just to do what he usually does um, counter you keep keep you at bay with the right hand and wave it and then counter you when you come in but Lomachenko's you know different levels you need a few you need a few game plans for Lomachenko. You're not going to outbox Vasily Lomachenko. Indeed. Indeed <laughs> you have yeah. to kind of, you, I think the only way you're going to beat Lomachenko is work rate. You have to dog him. Yeah. And, yeah. and do you know what? I, I think yeah. uh, for, for Lomachenko to lose, I think if he goes up in weight, uh, yes. As we talked about against Mikey Garcia, it could it could take a second now. I think he'd beat Mikey Garcia to be honest. It's a close fight. It's a close fight. The Linares fight would be amazing though because the stars would gel. Oh, phew, that'd be beautiful. Yeah, I think that's a fight that, um, due to as as the saying goes, stars make fights. I it's feel like I feel like um, Linares would have a um, a good chance because he's got work rate. And he throws punches in bunches. Well, you know, ho hopefully we can see Lomachenko go up and wait. And uh, it's gonna have to be because not many people soon enough are gonna want to fight um, Lomachenko anyway. So he's gonna end up going up and wait, definitely. Yeah. And and that's where you find you know the true greatness, don't you? When you know when you when you become a champion at different weight weight classes. Oh, that's greatness. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, because a lot of people are saying Triple G's um, pound for pound. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is pound for pound means pound for pound, right? Going up that's the way. That's right, yeah, yeah. And that's how you I look at it. Yeah, yeah, and as much as I respect and rate Triple G's a hell of a fighter, but he's only fought at 160. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? If, if anybody should win um, the award for, is it Boxer of the Year or whatever, I would have to say... Um, Mr. Crawford. Oh yeah, magnificent. You you watch at one four seven what he does. It's, that guy is he, so he, special. Key firm in there. One got, time. Um, Porter. Yeah. You know, you've got Garcia. Yeah. For me, he's got all. He's got all the uh, attributes. You know, to be king. At, you know, at that weight class. Him and um, Errol Spence is a mouth-watering fight. It, it surely is. <laughs> but back to Lomachenko. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, right. we see him. One thing with Lomachenko that we didn't talk about was what? the man that beat him retired on the same night, um, Orlando Salido. Oh, now, um, yes, yes. Yeah, now I'm sure he would have loved to avenge that defeat to Salido. That Wait, would have been interesting. Think, I think that's one of them that's always going to annoy him. But before Orlando Salido in his second fight, mm -hmm. so to be honest, fighting Orlando Salido in his second fight is a... <laughs> it's a mad task crazy, yeah. It's crazy, but I yeah. Think he just thought that you know what? I've had how many fights? I fought in the what's it called? The um, WSB, which is I think that's seven rounds anyway. So technically, five. Fighting, is it five? Yeah. So technically, oh, yeah, fighting in that, so technically, fighting in that is kind of pro anyway, if that makes sense. 
Because mm-hmm. it's no head guards as well. But yeah. Okay, indeed. Well, well, let's move on uh, and let's preview the massive fight in Canada this weekend. It's Billy Joe Saunders who defends his middleweight title, WBO middleweight title, against David Lemoon. Now, Pascal, Wait. despite Billy Joe's resume, if he wins this one, people really take notes of Billy Joe, and then he'll get a chance to cash out against either possibly Canelo or Triple G. I believe that uh, it's an important fight for Billy Joe, perhaps to some extent a career-defining fight because, you know, Billy Joe, as good as a boxer he is, he still doesn't have the recognition in England as being, you know, one of the the sort of the, the all important boxers. You know, he's a world champion, and uh, he, you know he's proven that that you know he's an awkward person to beat. He's an awkward fighter to beat. You know, and when he decides to train and to work hard, you know, he, he can be he can be a handful. But I think that the fight with De- David Lemieux is is a is a is very a dangerous, dangerous fight. fight. Very, very dangerous. dangerous. Fight. Lemieux has got power in both hands, you know. He's, he's also fought at, uh, you know, at some very, very high level. He's fought uh, like the Triple G, whom he lost against. But, you know, he's a dangerous fighter. <laughs> and he's also fighting away from home. So he, that home comfort that Billy Joe Saunders, you know, benefits from is not going to be there for him in Canada. And it's going to be a very hostile atmosphere. You know, but uh, you know, Billy Joe will certainly handle that. You know, being that he comes from from the gypsy community, <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he's used to all, all uh, manners of intimidation. So I'm sure that he will be able to su- surmount it. But he will also have some some support in Canada also because there's a bit uh, there's a big community of of of, of um, you know of, of traveling people there. But my concern primarily for Billy Joe Saunders is that mm. at that weight, Lemieux is very strong at that weight, very powerful, and he's not the most skillful of boxers. But certainly, in terms of the power punches, t- to me, they will certainly come from David Lemieux, and and Billy Joe will be, will have to sort be mindful of 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 the right hand coming over, and um, he will have to box his best, you know. But Billy Joe has very good footwork. You know, he's he's got very good boxing skill, and I expect Billy Joe to to you know to take the 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 fight to the to the very last two round, and I believe that he could win a split decision, you know, and that will certainly put him you know in, in give him the opportunity you know to to call the likes of Triple G. I would love to see a Triple G back into the United Kingdom against uh, against um, Billy Joe Saunders. I think that'd be an, an an interesting prospect for him, and possibly even bring Canelo to to the to the United. Kingdom, that that'll be yeah. great. Also, he's ranked number one with the WBO, so yeah, he, he could be in line to, to fight uh, uh, Tri- uh, Billy Joe anyway. Yes, I, I mean I believe that will be a very good fight, and uh, you know, Golden Boy Promotions will certainly look to bring Canelo, you know, and showcase his skill and his talent to the United Kingdom because he's he's a cash cow of Golden, you know, of, of Golden Boy, and perhaps a tour. And knowing that uh, Billy Joe has as a big Irish fan base, you know, perhaps bringing the fight to the UK, you know, a stadium fight, perhaps could be could be a very good one, you know. And 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 Frank Warren would love to to have a very big fight, you know, in the United Kingdom away from the Copper Box Arena yeah. and, and you know another thing Billy Joe's got going for him is uh, he really knows how to wind up his opponents so this time he's been a bit quiet I don't know why but uh, he I really knows how to get you unsettled before even the fight starts <laughs> You know, to, to be honest with you the fight it comes relatively close you, you know because he only just fought the other day you know um, and, and that that uh, against the the mongoose, you know, um, and that fight was a very good fight. You know, he fought very well, but I'm just concerned that that fight has come quite quite soon for him. But the fight was ordered by the, by, by the WBO, and uh, they certainly want Billy Joe to remain active, and they, they may have future plans for him. And that fight with Canelo Triple G could be one, you know, that it could be the interim fight um, that um, you know the both the both sets of fans want to see before they could be a, a sequel to the Triple G Canelo fight depending on, on, on how that fight goes but alternatively you know um, you could see Billy Joe Saunders uh, fighting a Cinco de Mayo provided that he, he beats David Lemieux so you know for Billy Joe it is again career defining fight for him and I think the next two fights will be very important for him as a boxer and in cementing his, his status as a, as, as, as a world champion now, now, Peter, this fight is very much um, it's been built the boxer versus the puncher um, the man's all about power 
And Billy Joe's is all about he's all about those skills in the ring, you know, box and move. For you, who comes out on top this weekend, Billy Joe or, or David Lemieux? I think I gotta go with a puncher on this one. Oh wow! Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So Billy Joe's gonna get first... found out, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I think he bit off a bit more than he can chew with Lemieux. Uh, I think uh, the way it went uh, with the announcement of the fight, I was very surprised uh, he took the fight with Lemieux so soon. He just fought in September. This Monroe, he went full in 12 December, rounds. Yeah. No, yeah, he didn't beat him in two rounds or one round. He went full 12. And before that, he didn't fight so so often. He fought like uh, once a year, and he go and go from that schedule to fight in three months. I think it's a bit too much to ask from Saunders. And no less, he didn't ever fought outside of UK before that as a pro. And to go to the Lions Den to Canada. Mm, to the new homeland, uh, I mm-hmm. think uh, it's a very dangerous proposition for Saunders. I think that the, the deck is going to be stacked against him. He's going to fight on Golden Boy card, and we all know <laughs> how that how that gonna get, how that gonna <laughs> go. Good, De La Hoya. If, if it ever goes to well, going to well, I don't think Saunders can win decision in Canada against Lemieux. Golden Boy card. And, and again, you know, Peter, we talked about um, what the judges want these days. You know, again, Billy Joe's got that Tevin Farmer. You know, get in and get out style, right? He's a, he's a pure yeah, he's boxer. A slick, and then, but- exactly, he's a slick star. And then you got the puncher and the move. He's going to work and look for that big opening. Yeah, he's a bit crude. Hey. Yeah, massively, yeah, massively. Uh- He's a bit crude, he's uh, going for... But Saunders has a tendency to... Uh, to get fatigued. You get fatigued in, in a second, yeah. Just like you did lot. against yeah. Eubank, yeah. That's the style, and isn't it? His style is... Yeah. Massive, massive puncher also. He just outflung him in the second, uh, in the second part of the fight. Mm-hmm. I think that's might gonna happen on this Saturday oh, wait. I think I'm going with you on unanimous decision wow yeah, shall we are, are we going to see uh, <laughs> su- <laughs> such, <laughs> such a result um, Canada to be fair it doesn't seem like it works fighters because I remember B-Hop's been there and the girl's been there right yeah yeah so I feel did, yeah. so I feel like it'll be fair and it's a situation if Billy Joe Saunders sticks to the game plan and keeps his angles and stuff, I think he'll make it pretty comfortable. But obviously, Lemieux's got that puncher's chance. But as long as Billy Joe can outbox him, keep his range in and out, and box, box smart and listen to instructions, I feel like Billy Joe Saunders could make it a comfortable fight. Yeah, and, and and let's not forget Billy Joe is in the best shape of his um, boxing career. With the Ing- yeah, with Dominic Ingo, yeah, 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 yeah. Because they He's, pride themselves on putting their fighters in terrific shape. That's it. It's, you know, you can't go off the ball. His preparation has been tip top. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, He's yeah. with one of the best stables in Britain historically as well so okay, he's got all that yeah. behind him and mm. we, we might just see you know further improvement from Billy Joe this when, weekend 100% I feel like the coach he's got Ingo he keeps you on your Ingo. toes and I feel yeah I feel like Dominic Ingo is one of them coaches that gets the best out of his fighters indeedy indeedy but right. I think Lemieux's gonna try and Lemieux's only shot of defeating Billy Joe is if he cuts off the ring well, I think Billy Joe Saunders will work around that. But the move's only chance is catching him, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. Punch the dance, yeah. He'll just, wait, he'll just wait for that big punch. Uh, punch, he left the walk. Yeah, that's the thing with Triple G. He's uh, brilliant, regardless of if you're a good boxer or whatnot. Triple G's really good as well at being able to cut the ring off, mm-hmm. no matter how skillful you are, yeah. Triple G, though, show, do you think. He is what Mayweather said he is, straight up and down, no effects. No special effects. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, 
Well, to be honest, um, I haven't seen anything else from him, but he's terrific at that at the basics. Um, yeah. Yeah. So fair enough. He might only be good at that thing, but he does. He cuts off the ring to um, brilliantly. So he is straight up and down, but <laughs> but the way he is straight up and down, he he's effective at it. So he hasn't right now. He hasn't had to have a plan B. <laughs> and I think the reason, you know what I mean. So, boy, maybe Floyd is right, but it's working for him. <laughs> and the reason is why, because it. So I do want to see after him and maybe Canelo fight again in a rematch. I want to see how Triple G does when he goes up, goes up in weight. That's it, and that's but what we're calling for. Yeah, because he would definitely wouldn't have um, been able to um, bully Andre Ward. Because Kovalev got bullied by Andre Ward And Kovalev's, a, you know, a huge puncher And a bully himself <laughs> <laughs> So, you know Now it's interview time This week we feature a premiership striker That I caught up with at the James DeGale versus Caleb Truax fight It's the Bournemouth FC player Benic Afobi Oh yo, it's Pep Talk UK, and I'm joined by the man himself, Bournemouth FC striker, Benekophobia, how you doing, Geese? Yeah, I'm good, mate, how are you? Not doing too bad, mate. Now, it's been um, a hell of a season for Bournemouth so far, um, the Premiership's frantic, it's very challenging. How would you assess Bournemouth FC's uh, season so far? Yeah, we've done well. Um, I'd be lying if I, if I said um, we, shouldn't have any, we shouldn't have more points on the board at the moment this time of the season but um, you know Premier League is hard it's the hardest league in the world and um, we're in the right place we're in the right direction and hopefully the second half of the season can be even better for us Yeah, you know as a football fan as well sometimes I find it a little bit well not strange but Bournemouth have come a long way yeah. like when you think of Bournemouth FC you don't necessarily think of the Premiership especially for foreign fans you know who, who support teams abroad so what about the, the city of Bournemouth how are they how are they enjoying Premiership football right now yeah, um, everyone knows that there's only one footballing team in Bournemouth, so like everyone knows who you are, everyone knows about the club that follows the club that lives in the areas of Paul, Dorset, Bournemouth, and um, it's a beautiful place to live. Um, to be honest, before I moved down to Bournemouth, I didn't know much about it. You know, just as a seaside, <laughs> London, boy, yeah? London boy through and through. Yeah, yeah. And um, when I got there, I thought, you know, it's, it's a different lifestyle. It's very different to London. You know, I'm used to the city life. I lived in Manchester when I was at Bolton and okay. lived in Sheffield, which was quite busy. Uh, Birmingham when I was at Wolves. So it was very different, but at the same time, it was um, peaceful and it was a good. It was a good difference for me because I could just um, settle down and concentrate on my football. And um, everyone's very welcome in there. Tomorrow. Yeah, that's it. What about on a personal? How's your season like individually? How's it gone for yourself personally? To be honest, I would like more minutes. You know, um, we've got good competition in the team. We've got a good squad now, and I've been working hard. And um, our players have been doing well, so it's quite tough for me at the moment. But as I said. Um, I've been in the game for a while now and um, I remember last season I was in the same position and then the second half of the season I was one of the better players uh, one of the, the first names in the team sheet so I'm just working hard grafting and um, I, got, I got a few minutes again today against Crystal Palace so I'm just working hard and hopefully I can start um, more games in the second half of the season and score some goals Okay. Now we're at the boxing at the Copper Box Arena watching Anthony Yard, James DeGale um, Daniel Dubois in terms of boxing, you must have found a boxing yeah, it's my second favourite sport after football. Um, I've been following it since the days of Mike Tyson when I was younger. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan, you know, and it's no secret, James DeGale's an Arsenal fan. Obviously, I've got links, I was at Arsenal yeah, before, Arsenal. Yeah, from yeah. 6 till 21. So. I'm a goon, I know, I know, I know all about you, man. You know, you know, you know. But um, yeah, um, I've seen James DeGale through mutual friends and we just became good friends. And um, not, not just that he's a, he's a good friend, but he's a good boxer as well and cracking stuff. Thanks for spending a bit of time with Pep Talk, mate. All the best this season. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you, Benick. All the best to Bournemouth FC and yourself for the rest of the season. Cracking stuff. Now it's football time. So we like, I'd like to welcome MJ in the building. How are you doing, Geez? Thank you, B. MJ in the building. Uh, yes. no, this week has actually been a very, very cold week. Apart from the snow that's been falling around, and I'm sure everyone knew it. We had Derby Day, and from the Liverpool point of view, let's just say I was pretty disappointed. But you know what? <laughs> you know, I think we've got a whole show to discuss this with all the panelists, which I'm looking forward to. 
to actually discussing this as well as what happened in the Battle of Manchester. Bloody hell. There's like milk going around. This is like pizza game. It's <laughs> just <Milk like>, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And as an Arsenal fan, we were disappointed once again with another poor weekend. But hey, what can you say? Um, okay, cool. Well, let's let's start with the biggest game of the weekend so far: uh, Man City versus Spurs. Now, Man City, uh, MJ, they've they've taken a record: fifteen consecutive victories. Uh, they've got a good chance of making it sixteen, haven't they, against Spurs? Or will it be a lot tougher? Well, to be honest, they've already made it 16 because uh, Swansea, <laughs> which they uh, yeah, I mean, they've, had, they've totally annihilated Swansea. So I think we can give them 16, actually setting the record. <laughs> and then they've got the big game, obviously, on the weekend, which is actually Spurs. But just to go back briefly, on last week's pod, we kind of called it Romelu Lukaku. We said he's not going to... Yeah, we said we weren't sure about how well he was going to show up. And you know what? He was at fault for both goals as well as missing a sitter right before the end. Do you know Manchester United fans are actually calling him Lukaka? <laughs> <laughs> They're calling him Rom the Lou, as in the toilet, Lukaka, because he's not showing up in big games, which, you know what, I mean, we actually like Romelu Lukaku over here, apart from the fact he plays for United. But, uh, no, man, the great on the day. Respect to Man City. They did the business at Manchester United, and uh, and yeah, it was it was a pretty good game. I do have to say. But M- Mourinho said they were lucky. A couple deflection, well, rebounds on route, you know, to the goals. Do you listen, think it was a case of that, or was that a bit of sour grapes? Or well, listen, mate. I think Jason Mourinho should be more concerned about washing up the milk that was spilled on his face by the Man <laughs> City players oh. <laughs> towards the end of last. You know, as opposed to uh, no. Listen, at the end of the day, Mourinho is captain deflector. I mean, man, Manchester United supporters for the first time seen Man City come over to Old Trafford, outplay them, playing a good round of football, whilst United were parking the bus. For the first time, I think Manchester United supporters were actually quite upset and were actually asking questions. So obviously, Mourinho is going to deflect. But no, I mean, we've got to give it to Man City. Currently, I sound not like Man City, but but you can't actually deny them. You mm. can't fault them. They actually do the business. And with the better side, I think we can all agree that. So it, it was a deserved three points. Yeah, but Spurs, you know, um, offer a different proposition to Man City this time. And if anyone's going to upset Man City, it could be Spurs, Harry Kane and all. Well, well, listen, in terms of tactics, Pochettino has actually been spot on in the game. You know, so g- going on this weekend, the fact is at Wembley and everything like that, I'm actually going to go for a Spurs win. I reckon Spurs are actually going to stop Man City from becoming invincible and they're going to beat them. And I think Spurs are going to win the game 2-1. Harry Kane amongst the goals, Son, Sonaldo, as he's called. <laughs> Sonaldo. Son is actually going to score the winner. What about yourself, Shoei? Do you see uh, Man City continuing rich vein of form? Or? Absolutely. They're, they're, you know, they're looking very strong at this minute. So as long as they stay consistent, it's going to be very hard to derail and defeat them at this moment in time. Especially with Man City at home. Um, there you go. It's going to be- Harry Kane is on flames right now, so... Yeah. I, you know, it just, I just feel that Man City have been... This is not sour grapes as an Arsenal fan, but... Right. Man City have been lucky in a few games. Right, They've had some right. key decisions that have gone their way. They've had some last-minute last, last minute goals as well. Yeah. That, that Eventually, that luck has to run out. Yep. Every dog has its day. <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? But yeah, it'll be interesting. But right now, Man City are very, very strong, and it seems like Sterling is finally getting the, you know, getting the accolades that he deserves. Mm-hmm. He's improving. Yeah, he's scored a lot of goals. Yeah, and he's finishing, and his his end products is improved. Definitely. Yeah, because remember, bro, he's still mad young. He's only 23. Yeah, but you know, I was saying that about, I was saying that about Wilcott. You know, I've been saying that about Wilcott for 10 years. Oh, and, you know, that, uh, and yeah. now he's got a full-grown beard, and you know, not, there's been no changes, mate. You know, nah, it's a progress. Yes, yeah. Sometimes you have to be like, okay, he's, you're not, you're not 
you're not that same age no more, so what's going on? Yeah. You're not, you're not that's progressive. True. There you go. Pa- Pascal? Wait, wait. How, how are we looking for this game? Man City or Spurs? You, you, you know, it's certainly one of the games where I would like Spurs to, to at the very least, you know, derail Manchester City. But the problem with momentum, once you have it, you become so attractive, it becomes difficult to to derail that. And I'm sorry, but Manchester City are, are looking like they are winning the, the league relatively comfortably. Comfortably, I think for Pochettino, he's going to have to get his tactics correct because Manchester City could be an opponent for him, not just in the league but also in the Champions League. So he's going to certainly look at a way in which he can he can stop and at the, and contain the midfield, the likes of David Silva, Kevin De Bruyne. They, they're the main threats coming forward. Also, the Sterling has been having the blinding season. And if you can sort of, you know, stop the supply of Kevin De Bruyne to, to David Silva, I believe that Spurs have an opportunity to to take a point out of the game. You know, and it's important for Spurs also and for Pochettino to to not want make his his players consider moving away in in the summer because you know if Carl Walker, mm-hmm. you know, so suddenly this wins the league this season, I believe that you could see an exodus next next year at uh, at Tottenham where a lot of players will be going to various, you know, competitive teams in the hope of securing better paychecks but also um, a, a trophy because, you know, it's not uh, it's not the, the kind of um, this, it's not the kind of desertion that Pochettino wants his players to go to and I know that a lot of players, you know, are in the sight of Manchester City Danny Rose, for instance, is one player that could also get, get to the, Man- the Manchester City side so it's important for United. Yep. Manchester United also, you know, and uh, it's important for, for Spurs and for Pochettino to take a point that, out of that game and if they were to win the game it would also help them to get back into that top four contention so I, I think that the game will be actually a very tight and very close game I, I think that uh, you know I, I, I'm seeing a, a stalemate you know I, I'm not seeing you know I, I believe that Pochettino will actually set the team to to defend against Manchester City and they will try to get them into the into the counter attack because they've got some good players Spurs going forward they've got Son they've got Harry Kane they've got Deli Ali who's not been as consistent this season but uh, we know during big games he enjoys the the, uh, the he enjoys the um, the 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 the, uh, the, the, the added um, you know uh, the, the popularity of, of big games you know and I think that uh, Deli Ali will certainly can play a people to hold during that game. And uh, Harry Kane certainly can only score during big games, so it, it could be it could be a zero zero, interestingly, or it could also be a two on draw. But I've got, I'm leaning towards a two on draw. You know, I think that Spurs will score some goals there, and um, it could be a draw. Oh, draw. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, we move on to the next game: Bournemouth mm-hmm. versus Liverpool. Now, no better than MJ to break the game down and who we think is going to win. Well, listen, Baggy B, in the last two seasons, it's not really been great for Liverpool. Last season, actually being 3-1 up and managing to lose 4-3, one of the lowest. Yes, that was a big shocker. Listen, it's been one of the lowlights on the Jorgen Klopp. We just couldn't cope with the, with the winger that, that, that they actually brought up. We couldn't cope with him. Francis, I believe his name was. He was Ryan Francis. He was absolutely amazing on the day. But having said that, Liverpool actually looking to build up some momentum, especially at the moment we seem to be trying to match Arsenal result for result. If Arsenal lose, we lose. If Arsenal <laughs> draw, we draw. Hopefully this weekend, Arsenal might win, so we desperately need a win. And for that reason, and also with Mohamed Salah still leading the scoring cards and doing very, very well, it's I'm going to 3-1 it's Liverpool, because God knows we can score goals, but we can't keep a clean sheet. Yeah, and, and you know I sympathise with that penalty that uh, Everton got the other day. That was oh. that was shocking. That was shocking. But especially on Derby Day, you know. <laughs> but, but, but you know, I haven't said that Lovren is just not good enough. You know, listen, you're going to make me bored. He's brilliant, mate. He is Let's a top defender, on. mate. That's in the past. Let's move on because <laughs> seriously, you know, you know I, I can't even blame. Calvin Lewis for going down because what Lovren did was inexcusable. I mean, it was almost as bad as what uh, yeah, Metzaka did against uh, did against S- going S- down to Leeds. It's almost as guilty as that. It was that sort of thing. But no, for this game, West Brom away. Uh, sorry, 
but uh, Bournemouth away, I'm going 3-1 Liverpool. Yeah. And, and, and before we move on to Shoei, you know how I feel when uh, Emmanuel Abue brought down Dirk Kite that time in the 90th minute? Um, <laughs> <laughs> now you know how I feel. <laughs> You're definitely taking this back. <laughs> Right. Now, Sherry, um, yeah. what, what are you saying about this game? Are Bournemouth going to stun Liverpool again? I'm going Liverpool 100%. Okay. Just Salah's in great form. And he's he's on fire and I don't understand why Chelsea got rid of him, if I'm being honest. Mm. Well, yeah, and, and De Bruyne. And, and Lukaku. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Salah's, you know, he's a little gem. Great technique. And, he, and right now he's scoring for fun and I think that's him saying to Chelsea what what, what would you do it? <laughs> yeah. You know, do you know I mean? as as we said last week he's the only player to bring back the Jericho you know and actually score goals <laughs> He's brought back the MJ the MJ <laughs> the, Michael J, the Michael Jackson or, filler Or the Rick James the Rick James <laughs> <laughs> Pass, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? Uh, Bournemouth going to beat Liverpool uh, Liverpool going to win? I would love for Bournemouth to win, the, to beat Liverpool. You know, it, it would certainly re- relieve a lot of pressure, you know, in, in our hunt in securing a top four place. But, you know, uh, I believe that Jurgen Klopp will do whatever he can to, to, you know, he's looked at the Champions League draw and Porto are not a bad side to play against. So as far as uh, Klopp is concerned, he knows that his team has the talent and uh, you know, and the verve to beat the likes of Porto in the Champions League. So Jurgen Klopp is now trying to cement his position in the league, and I believe that he will set up the team in a way that they will take they will take a result out of Bournemouth. So I expect Mohamed Salah and the likes of Sadio Mane and Coutinho to put on a good performance and uh, and and to win the game. You know, uh, for me, it's a for con- conclusion. The pressure is on between Liverpool and Arsenal to keep the results going. And I can see Liverpool winning that game quite comfortably, but lead by two clear goals at the very at the very least. Liverpool are always they're always good away from home as well in terms of the way they're set up. The two wingers, you know, Mane Salah, that is just too much pace, mate. Either mm-hmm. side, mm-hmm. Firmino poaching the goals, mate. Milano's on the bench as well. If they need to change it, mate. Liverpool's attack is serious, mate. Too serious. much sauce. Too much sauce. Yeah, but but they need to they yeah, need to yeah, they, they, they need to hold down the photo. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely gives you a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Indeed. Okay, now our final game that we'll look at is Arsenal versus uh, Newcastle. Now we'll start we'll start with Pascal in this one. Uh, sh- this should be straightforward for Ars- um, Arsenal. Newcastle not I mean, in any you know, great form. I, I believe that Arsenal are now in, in desperate need to capitalise on 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 more points. It's the classic Arsenal where, where the games the, the games that we expect Arsenal to win comfortably, mm, they not yeah. they they not winning, and the games against the big clubs they are losing. So it's a frustrating turn of events where we lack the creativity. You know, we we lack the desire to to you know to. to to put those those team away as 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 they say you know and uh, and I was a bit disappointed by the performance in Southampton. I'm not sure if it's the the you know the temperature dropping uh, you know which has an issue with the players' performance. But you know Vagar needs to use that particular time. You know, particularly it's just like Arsenal to bottle it though on a cold day away from home in Southampton on the coast. But you know, Frankie B is a very important period because the Christmas break and the Christmas, um, the, the, the Christmas schedule is so relentless that those points need to be picked up right now because there will certainly be a few defeats during that Christmas schedule, believe you me. And if Arsenal continue to draw games that they should be winning, you know, they will, they will find themselves in, in, you know, pretty difficult position to, to try and cement their place in the top four position. But, you know, a home game against Newcastle, I'll expect Arsenal to get back to winning ways following the Set back against Manchester United. Newcastle are also struggling to find some, you know, some 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 momentum to to score goals, let alone win games. So I believe that uh, you know it will be an interesting game for Arsenal. It will be difficult to break because Rafa Benitez knows Wenger very well. He knows how to play against him, and uh, it would be a very difficult first 20 to 25 minutes. But I expect the game to become quite expensive. I, I expect yeah. the game to be quite expensive. And uh, I expect uh, Arsenal to win by 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 three goals. Uh, shall we? Yeah. Um, Arsenal they're clearly uh, in a superior uh, team than Newcastle. Yeah. We're expecting I'm a home win, aren't we? I see a draw, bro. A draw. Yeah. Newcastle are going to be up for it. 
Newcastle, even though Arsenal are going to be favourite, Newcastle have always been a Newcastle and Arsenal have always had good games. And yeah, I, I, remember, I, I remember when Graham Paul was interfering in, the, in them games. I remember that quite clearly. Oh, the referee! <laughs> <laughs> I see a draw, my brother. To be fair, draw. Mm. MJ, what are you what are you saying? Well, first of all, I want to say a shout out to Sheikh Tiote. Obviously, RIP Sheikh Tiote. It just comes to mind. He scored his one Premier League goal versus Arsenal for Newcastle in that amazing 4-4. I think we all remember Arsenal being 4-1 up and somehow managing to bottle it and actually getting that 4-4 draw in like the 93rd minute or whatever it is. Typical Arsenal. Typical. Having said that, Wayne Rooney scored against, uh, scored against Newcastle. Uh, and during midweek so there's a lot of issues with Newcastle at the minute there's a lot of issues and John Joe Shelby will actually be suspended for the Arsenal game so we're talking a depleted Newcastle squad Newcastle can't seem to score goals you know it's rich back when you're relying on a Hosselu who couldn't get a game at Stoke playing attacking midfielder and that's their man number nine so there's so many issues at Newcastle Rafa Benitez has not been happy mm-hmm. uh, over. Newcastle about to have a takeover in which Amanda Steveley is actually going to leave this consortium to actually buy him out before Christmas so we're talking in the next few days for it to be completed but however for this game versus Arsenal you, you're only looking one way it's going to be Arsenal so yeah Arsenal are going to win Nice and comfortably 2-0 Because Newcastle can't defend They can't score at the moment And Rafa Benitez Desperately needs some reinforcements Boy right. we, we will see We will see And we'll talk about it next week Now that's our time I'd like to thank MJ Showy Petr Sugarov And Pascal Join us again next week For another Pep Talk UK podcast Don't forget to hit the subscribe button And leave your comments in the box below Thank you.